I know, I'm not the guy who usually stands up here. When I was a kid, one of the more tedious Sundays in church was Missionary Sunday. If you are visiting with us this morning, um, you may be in for a bit of Christian suffering uh, because <laughs> this is like Missionary Sunday. You get one of the elders uh, preaching for you. We're glad you're here, though. Karen is not here either this morning. We made an offer on a house yesterday, and it was accepted uh, contingent on our walking through, and that house is in Auburn, Alabama, and she is driving down there. It sort of reminds me of the parable about the great banquet and the man who is invited and he says he can't come because he has to go look at a piece of property. Well, you can draw your own conclusions there. Uh, this morning, uh, I've got love on my mind. I've had love on my mind ever since last week, thanks to a rather profound question that Chest asked us about halfway through his sermon. It wasn't a yes, no kind of question. It wasn't even one of those questions that you tend to get in Sunday school where nine times out of 10, if you say Jesus, you're gonna get the answer right. No, this, this was a tough question. This was a question that makes you have to think. And indeed, I've had this question rolling around in my mind ever since, supplemented by the passage from Acts that you've just heard Kathy read. They go together. In case you were away or don't remember, Chess was talking about 1 Peter, the first chapter, and Peter's instruction to diaspora Jews, now Christians, to have sincere love for each other, loving one another deeply from the heart. And here's what Chess asked us. I wrote it down. He said, how much genuine love have you experienced in your life? Put a pen in that. We're going to get back to it. Chess did share with me this bit of advice, this line uh, the other day. He said, a sermon should leave your hearts burning for more like when Jesus taught the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Well, that's a pretty high bar, I'd say, particularly when I'm the one trying to fan the flames. Holy Spirit rained down this morning. I want to talk with you about Christian community. That's my topic this morning, Christian community. Unless you think I'm referring to a housing development for Republicans, I'm not. I'm going to talk about the church, and I'm here to tell you that the church is a good thing, a thing you need, and that should come as no surprise to you. As an aside, have you ever noticed that there's not a single reference in the New Testament to anyone taking communion by themselves? No, it takes community to commune. You can't Christian alone. I'd even go so far to say that faith is incomplete outside of community. Faith is a holistic endeavor, not an individualistic thing. I hope to make the case to you this morning, about church that is, that it's good, and I'm going to make three arguments. I'm going to make an argument from scripture, I'm going to make an argument from science, and I'm going to make an argument from experience. So you ready? Let's begin. An argument from scripture. If you want to know in scripture what Peter's admonition in his epistle to have sincere love for one another, loving one another, another deeply from the heart looks like, a picture of what that is, Acts 2, 42 through 47 is the obvious place to go. There we find a remarkable scene of early Christian community. Not just remarkable, but countercultural and maybe even a little weird. Let's give it a look again. And, as, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. It's quite a scene. 
Let's give a look at these individual pieces. I'd like to point out a few highlights. First, Luke tells us that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, devoted to being taught, devoted to the study or discussion of what the apostles were teaching them. And what might that have been? Well, obviously, one would expect they are teaching Jesus. But remember, this is a group of people who have the basics down pat. They have embraced what Paul is later going to describe in 2 Corinthians as things of first importance. They know that Christ was the Son of God, that he came to earth and lived as a man, that he was crucified and buried and rose from the grave on the third day, ascended to heaven, and now reigns there and someday will bring us home to him. They had heard that sermon. Peter had preached it, and it was their time of conversion. It's where they executed this pivot. They confessed their sins and repented and were baptized. What they need now, what I expect the apostles are teaching, is how to live like Jesus lived, how to love one another, how to stay connected to their Father in heaven. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. We also see that they were committed to fellowship and breaking of bread. Can you imagine that church social? Was it cocktail weenies and poppy seed chicken casserole in the fellowship hall adjacent to the temple? Eh, maybe, maybe not. The, the point is, they were eating together. And we all know that sharing a meal with someone is a great way to build and strengthen relationships. Here they are spending time together, getting to know one another, sharing not only the gospel, but their lives as well. Luke tells us that they were also devoted to prayer. Not just prayer, but the prayers, the traditional Jewish prayers. I wonder sometimes if we don't look at that passage on the day of Pentecost and think, uh, in Acts 2, and think that God is sort of like Mighty Python and saying, and now for something completely different. Well, what happened on the day of Pentecost and what came after is different, but it's not completely different. These Christ followers still see themselves as Jews, embracing the Jewish prayers in their worship and lives. They have not moved off into a commune somewhere or separated themselves from their native culture. Rather, they have woven this new thing into their culture, or maybe vice versa. Anyway, devoted to praying together. Next, we read that they are together and sharing all things in common, so much so that they're selling possessions to give to anyone who had need. Now, we're not talking about a hippie commune here. At least, I don't think we are. I think the point we should draw is that they are spending time together and taking care of one another. They aren't particularly interested in who has the best house or the best clothes or the friendliest donkey. They are trying to make sure that anyone who has need gets what they need by sharing it amongst themselves, even to the point that they're sharing property to take care of others. They tangibly demonstrate their love for each other by sacrificially serving and supporting one another. Next, they meet together daily with glad and generous hearts. No one complaining that, I don't want to sit by Sister Seuss, who says she smells funny and don't make me stand by him. He sings off key and goodness, I don't want to have to get buttonholed by brother such and so in the lobby because he's just going to tell me about all his ailments. No. The point is, what they had in common, their relationship in Christ, made them enjoy being together, made them not just tolerate, but maybe even appreciate each other's quirks. They were bound by a common love. Lastly, we find that they're praising God. And we would expect that, of course. That should come as no surprise. But what is a little bit unexpected is that they have the goodwill of all the people. All the people. Think about that. This sect, this new sect, one with really creepy, strange beliefs, meeting in the temple, and they are admired. They are respected by all the people. That would mean other non-believing Jews. It would likely mean visitors to Jerusalem. It might even mean the Roman soldiers garrisoned there. Notice that these Christians in this passage are not protesting. 
They are not forming political parties. They are not taking a stand on the important issues of the day. No. They are simply praising God and loving and serving one another and, 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 because of how they are living, they have quickly earned the respect of the broader community around them. There are lessons there for us. Now, why have I taken pains to describe in such detail what's going on in this church? I mean, you've heard it read at least twice now. I've done it because understanding is as much an act of the imagination as it is of the intellect. And Acts 2, 42 through 47 is a beautiful picture of what Christian community can look like. We can see it in our mind's eye. It shows us that when we come together in faith, we can experience profound blessings and actual benefits. And not only that, but we can influence the secular culture around us. That's the argument from scripture. Next, an argument from science. Research shows that church is good for us. Let that sink in. Research shows that church is good for us. Not good for us like Metamucil is good for some of us of a certain age, but I'm talking about really no nasty side effects, good for us in terms of both our mental and physical health. There is abundant research that shows that church going correlates with happiness. Now, faith is about belief in a higher power, of course, but it also commits us to behaviors that are good for us, like going somewhere at least once a week and gathering and singing and praying and worshiping and giving and studying and fellowshipping with a bunch of people we have something in common with. It has the effect of rooting us. It binds us to a community, a family. It provides a support network. Definitive research also shows that church-going, religious practice in general, leads to lower levels of stress, anxiety, and depression. And by the way, there are no footnotes in this sermon, but if you need me to document this science afterwards, shoot me an email. I'll be happy to share uh, those with you. It really is hard to footnote a sermon. Um, one important study found that those who attended church at least once a week had 33% lower mortality risk compared with those who never attended. That's not all. Church going has been linked to increased resilience and coping skills. One study found that religious people were better able to cope with stress and trauma than their non-religious counterparts. And of course, a church family can provide social support, a sense of belonging, which are crucial factors in maintaining good mental health. Well, what about physiological benefits? Well, prayer and meditation have been shown to reduce blood pressure and heart rate, promote cardiovascular health. Another study found that those who engaged in religious practices had lower levels of cortisol, the hormone associated with stress. Overall, church going, Belonging to a faith community has been linked to all kinds of mental and physical benefits. Maybe these don't apply evenly to everyone, but they do suggest that religious devotion can have a positive impact on well-being. Now, I have called this science, but I would suggest to you that it's more than science. It's also the providence of God. He has wired us to need each other to live in community, to belong, it's good for us. That's the argument from science, or rather, providence. Now, an argument from experience. Forgive me if I talk about myself for a moment. Because of church, I have had the blessing of being loved across the entire Southeast. Alabama, North Carolina, Jackson, Mississippi, Richmond, Virginia, Charlotte, North Carolina, and now here. And it is a blessing. I'm here to tell you that being loved like I've been loved is no small thing. Take a look at this slide. About 98% of you in this auditorium don't know any of these people. 
And the few of you who know some of them don't know all of them, and that's okay because it's kind of an exclusive list. It's not a complete list, not hardly, and, and in fact, many of you here aren't listed, but probably should be. This is a sort of pantheon, a part of my great cloud of witnesses who in part came to mind when I began to think about how I and my family, my kids, have been genuinely loved in churches we've been a part of. Now, a few of these folks, if you knew them, had known them, some of them you might describe as a little strange, a little out there, a little nutty, with some strange views on a range of things. My kids sometimes like to remember one or two of these folks and chuckle about some of those strange things they would say or strange political views. And I have to turn and remind them, yeah, but she loved you to death. She taught you in Bible class. She encouraged you. She asked after you. She prayed for you. She cut up with you. And it reminds me that church should not be a place where we go to be agreed with. It's a place we go to be loved. How much genuine love have you experienced in your life? I look at that list that I showed you and I say plenty, more than my share, good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over. And I'm betting many of you have similar stories. You have your own pantheon. I also recognize that some of you may not. Some of you were not brought up going to church. Don't sweat it. I'm not here to suggest you, to you that because I did, I'm somehow superior, not at all. Or perhaps you have been deeply injured or wronged or discouraged in the past by church people. I'm so sorry for that. I can't change it, but here you are, praise God, which says to me that despite what you've been through, you have that God-shaped hole inside of you that you suspect this community of believers can help fill. Look, there are lots of ways you can find community, work teams, PTA, band boosters, community associations, choruses, sports groups, book clubs, coffee clashes, pickleball teams, and yes, even, I've learned this recently, juries. Lots of ways. Every one of those is what social scientists call a weak tie. And they're important. They have value. They enrich you. I know this from an article I read this past week in the New York Times. But this church is more than that, more than those. Now, my kids are going to watch this video and they're going to say, Dad, you sound like Clint Eastwood in that movie yelling, get off my lawn. But I wonder sometimes how people who move to a new place can thrive without a church, without the strong tie support network that it can provide. Because here we experience a sense of belonging and connection that can be difficult to find in those other places. As we share our lives with one another, we find comfort, support, and encouragement in the midst of a world gone haywire. Here we find life enriched and transformed by study and worship and giving and service. And here we praise God and live together in a way that we hope will earn us the goodwill of all the people. Another word about the notion of loving one another deeply. I need to dispossess you of the idea that loving one another is about some gooey, sentimental feeling. I suppose it can be that, but the mutual love we are called to is not gooey feeling. It is love as behavior, love that acts, that serves, that encourages, love that sits with you in hospital waiting rooms, love that eats with you and prays over you, love that teaches, that fellowships, that weeps with you and worries about you, love that checks up on you, that holds your hand, that cheers for you, 
Love that inconveniences you. Love that raises your kids with you. Love that calls on a Friday afternoon and says, hey, let me keep the kids tonight so you two can go out and enjoy yourselves for an evening. It is love that sees you through difficulty. Love that challenges you. Love that bears with you. Love that occasionally rolls its eyes at you and might even frustrate the stew out of you from time to time and vice versa. For love like that, welcome, I say, to the Lord's church because that's what loving each other deeply from the heart looks like. That's Acts 2, Christian community. Chess talked last week about the sacrifice we make to be here. Yes. And I'm surprised there weren't a bunch of amens when he mentioned that it is a sacrifice to be here. Look, I know from experience the struggle to get the babies dressed, the kids ready. I know what it's like to arrive at church completely exhausted, splattered with baby food, ready to collapse into the pew, praying the nursery worker doesn't have to come fetch you at some point during the service. I know that. I know the anxiety of ignoring work emails that continue to drop into your email box even on Sunday morning. I know that the yard needs mowing and the house needs cleaning and boy how I'd just like to grab a cup of coffee and curl up with a book for a few minutes. And yet, here we all are. It is what we do for the love of Christ and for our own good and for our love of his church. I am reminded of Jesus' words that were read earlier from John 10. Jesus says, he's the good shepherd who cares for his sheep and leads them to safety. We listen to his voice and follow him. In this, we are reminded that we are not alone, that we are cared for, and that we are called to follow him together, not as individual sheep, but as a flock. And as we do, we can experience the abundant life he promises us. Not some future life in eternity, or not only that, but abundant life here and now in this place, in community with our fellow believers. So let us be encouraged. Let us come together in Christian community. Let us devote ourselves to Jesus' teaching and fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer, let us gather this morning around this table and be reminded of the benefits that come from living in community with one another. And let us be inspired to pursue righteousness and justice and mercy as we follow in the footsteps of our Good Shepherd. Forgive my emotion, 59 years of church community. May the Lord bless us and keep us. And may his face shine upon us and give us peace. Jeff, would you lead us in a song?